All right, good morning and welcome to the second lecture in the 2020-21 Levy series. Uh, today we'll have Dr. Tim Winter from the University of Western Australia uh, to speak to us on uh, Silk Road and China's use of geocultural power uh, to pursue its uh, interest along the BRI and other projects. Uh, in a way, this is a good follow-up to our first lecture. For those of you who attended it, uh, you remember the speaker talked about geography as a way of thinking in space, similarly to how history was a way to help you think in time. And uh, on today's topic, we're looking essentially at a way how the Chinese are using history to act in, in space and access geography. So it's uh, maybe more underground follow-up to what we heard about last week. So in a minute, I'll turn it over to Tim. And then once the lecture's over, uh, we'll unmute you and uh, just raise your hands and uh, Tim will take questions as they come in. So without any further ado, uh, Tim Winter. Thanks, Chris. And um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all. I think this is going to be a really interesting session. Hopefully it will connect with the other themes of the course um, and offer some uh, different ways of thinking about um, how to think about international affairs. So as Chris says, I'm going to be looking at um, China's, uh, as it says in that title, Revival of the Silk Roads. And of course, this is playing out in the context of um, the Belt and Road Initiative. So what I want to do um, for the next uh, I guess 40 minutes or so is speak to this quote here, which is from a, mo a new book uh, by Phillips and Rue Smith, Smith, which is called um, uh, Culture and Order in World Politics, if anybody wants to look that up. And as they say there, with notable exceptions, I ask scholars continue to write about culture as though nothing new has been said since the 1950s. And for their part, cultural specialists have done little to pay uh, more little to apply their more recent insights to the issues that most concern IR scholars, not least questions of international order. So I'm a sociologist and I kind of think I really sit in between these two and, and I guess I try to bridge that divide and have done for the last uh, couple of decades. And, and one of the ways in which I'm doing that uh, and have been doing that for the last few years is to address what's going on in the Belt and Road Initiative. And I imagine all of you um, or most of you will be familiar with this in one form or another. It's a project that was launched in 2013. Um, observers around the world have been struggling to understand how to think about this Belt and Road Initiative. It was originally called One Belt, One Road. Um, that's been renamed in its, in its English version in the last few years. Um, and these are the types of maps that you see that represent this project. And, and these are the types of maps and diagrams and graphics that get presented in reports, in think tank uh, publications, in journalistic studies and and in other um, types of publications. And in here you see this idea of this overland and the maritime Silk Road, which is obviously the one belt and the one road that are supposedly being revived for the 21st century. Um, now I uh, think there's something really interesting going on there and hopefully I will be able to communicate that to you today. So what we've seen in the academic world is um, an explosion to give a not for a better word of, of academic production around how to think about this Belt and Road Initiative. And as you see from these small sample of publications, there are a variety of themes that get discussed, but invariably the focus is on Belt and Road as a uh, geopolitical project, a geo-economic or geostrategic project, with a focus overwhelmingly uh, being given to trade infrastructure and transnational and trans-regional forms of connectivity across maritime and, and land-based domains. However, I've been sort of observing um, uh, another theme, and this is what I'm going to talk about for you this morning. But in those um, uh, uh, those stylistic representations of this uh, of these two sweeping curves of the overland and maritime Silk Road, what well, that also uh, really kind of um, belies the complexity of is the the, the ways in which China has been producing and leading a diplomatic architecture around its Belt and Road countries. So here's a few of the types of trips that have, uh, Xi Jinping has been leading since 2013. Um, in the bottom row, you see their visits to Kazakhstan, but also to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank um, on the right-hand side there, and 
to the left of Putin, but also to uh, to the UNESCO to launch this both at a bilateral and a multilateral uh, uh, way. Excuse me, Tim. Yep. Have, did you switch your slides? Or are you on, still on your same slide? I'm on where there's a grid of photographs. Is that not showing? No, it's not showing. Ah, that's annoying. It seems yeah. to be frozen. Okay. Sharing is paused, it says. Resume share. That's odd. Okay. Have I been deactivated as host or? I don't know. Uh... No, sir, you should still be host. It should still be able to, um, to share. I'll stop share and I'll restart it. Uh, let's try it. No. Uh... Okay, let's try that one. Okay, there it is. Does that work again? Yep. What I've got to do now is just get it to go full screen. Does that work? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it says your screen sharing, right? So so I'm not sure where you got to, but uh, there were the kind of types of publications which I hopefully you saw. Yep, that's where we lost it. Yeah, okay. So there was only one slide ahead of that. So um, so this is what I was talking about in terms of the both the types of bilateral and multilateral uh, um, initiatives that has been launched under the, under the uh, Belt and Road agenda. And of course, um, to speak to that issue of, of the focus within academia around infrastructure and trans-regional connectivities, this is a this is a Washington-based uh, think tank that's uh, been tracking uh, the the uh, projects that China's been funding around the Eurasian continent and down to East Africa, um, and many of them now um, are, have either been rebranded or or discussed and and, and uh, funded as Belt and Road projects since 2013. So you can see the scale of connectivity and, and, and investments that uh, China's um, making around a number of regions. However, what gets far less attention is the, are the cultural projects and this use of history, this idea of the Silk Roads, um, partly because they don't uh, attract the multi-million dollar co uh, contracts that uh, the, the infrastructure projects do, but also because um, they're seen as uh, somewhat trivial, less uh, strategically significant, and so on and so forth. However, as I say, and, and the, the book I will show you later is, is a, uh, an attempt to show, suggest there's far more going on here than has been acknowledged so far. So in terms of uh, the, these cultural projects, what's, uh, how do we understand the significance of this is one of the questions which a number of people are now starting to really address. So here's a story from, uh, from this week's Foreign Affairs or this most recent publication of Foreign Affairs, which came out yesterday which is uh, by Ode Westad, which a uh, Yale historian of the Cold War, which discusses, as you can see from that title, um, what makes uh, China tick and, and, how, and why does the US still struggle to understand China um, in some certain respects. So as that opening line, or actually that, that clip is taken from halfway down the article, but it asserts that China's policy is driven by a toxic mix of nationalism and past grievances. Now, that discussion of past grievances obviously uh, invariably focuses on the century of humiliation, as it's called, within the modern uh, period of Chinese history. However, what it doesn't uh, begin to also um, address is, is the other types of history that are figuring into Chinese, both domestic policies and its international agenda. So for that, we need to look into articles such as this one, which is a, uh, around Chinese political nostalgia, and the idea of the, the, the dream of the great rejuvenation. This has been a uh, project that's been a number of years in the making. Um, and this article gives a very good example of that, which focuses on the use and, and privileging of deep histories now and the glorification of a Chinese civilization. And what we're seeing then is, is a conflation between the modern polity that is the Chinese, the PRC, the Chinese, uh, or the China as a country, as we understand it today with its, its uh, um, political boundaries so, and its institutions, and the idea of a Chinese or Sinic civilizational space in East Asia. 
Those are, um, as James Millwood writes, it's, it's, um, they're not so easy to align, but that we're seeing a political project of doing that in the 21st century under Xi Jinping. And, and therefore a number of Chinese commentators and academics are, are uh, privileging the idea of a civilizational state that has many qualities and, uh, and understandings that can lead international affairs and speak to the global agendas of the 21st century. So in that respect, what we're also seeing uh, is huge investments in China into this revival of this cultural past and this civilizational past and a great pride in, in this uh, deep cultural history of the country. So here's an example from Xi'an in Northwest China. And this is a city that's celebrated as the gateway of the Silk Road. And the structure you can see in the far distance is the uh, pagoda of Xuanzang where Buddhism uh, entered China or supposedly into China um, uh, centuries ago. So this is a, uh, a public square that uh, has been built in the last decade or so. And it's just one of many, many examples of urban planning that now speaks to this uh, pride and rejuvenation of this deep cultural past. And so I think there's something particularly significant going on there at the domestic level and, and the amount of funds that are um, being invested in that. So what you see in that example in Xi'an is how it connects to this idea of the Silk Road. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Silk Road, but possibly not in any great detail. It has this vague imaginary to it about uh, camels crossing deserts between East and West, trade routes between China and Europe. So it's, it's very much this vague, uh, romanticized idea of history. So one of the things I've been sort of understanding or seeking to understand is how this idea came about in the modern world. And so there is, it's exploded in the international attention given to the Silk Roads in the last few years, particularly on the back of Belt and Road. And if you go to Amazon, you'll see publication after publication after publication now talking about Silk Road histories. Uh, this is the example of the international bestseller, Peter Frankopan's book, with the subtitle of The New History of the World. However, in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a bit of sense where this concept of the Silk Roads has come from. So back in 1870, uh, or the early 1870s, the German um, geologist um, and, and geographer, Ferdinand von, von Richthofen, who was also a baron, traveled to China, um, sponsored in part by uh, the German government and some American and British corporations, with the prospect of building a transcontinental railway. In Northwest China, there were heavy coal reserves, and there was, and Europe and particularly Germany was industrializing fast. There was anxieties about impending conflicts. And so coal was obviously part of the critical energy infrastructure of the late 19th century. Uh, von Richthofen had been uh, in uh, surveying in the, uh, in the US in the years preceding this um, for the Transcontinental Railway, which again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So he was sponsored to try and um, uh, survey Northwest China for a, a, a route that would connect all the way across to Europe. But he was also interested in history. And um, so on his return to uh, a European, uh, to a German university, he published a number of uh, publications over, over the subsequent decades the, in a multi-volume series called China, the first of which included a chapter um, called, uh, with a, with a, um, in German, uh, the German equivalent of the Silk Roads, this spoke to um, some uh, Chinese sources that he had found in China and some European documentation, um, very, very extremely vague and uh, circumspect about the trade route between uh, Europe in during, and particularly the Roman Empire and Han Dynasty China. Um, so the two centuries either side of the birth of Christ or the life of Christ and the trade routes, which were fragmented, broken up, but, uh, but there were a number of connections that seemed to be historically passed down, or knowledge about those being historically passed down, of those connections um, during those, that kind of a Roman Empire, Han Dynasty period. But what he was offering was a very, very small glimpse of pre-modern Eurasian connectivities, and focused primarily on a, a Northwest uh, uh, China as it is today and Central Asia. But the coining of that term didn't really gain any currency in academia and it only really began to gain uh, some uh, visibility in Europe, particularly in the public imagination in the 1930s. And there were a number of reasons for that. Some of his students published books, notably the Swedish explorer Sven Hayden, 
who was a great writer, a great expedition uh, or traveler. And he was sponsored by Lufthansa in the 1930s to scope out potential um, uh, uh, airports up in Northwest China for, for linking again, um, Peking to, to Western Europe through a, a multi-stop air, airline route or airport route. So in that time, as you see from this engram, that was the moment when the Silk Road begins to enter the public imagination. But as what that slide also uh, illustrates is um, uh, it doesn't really gain currency until the 1980s. So, um, sorry, I should have shown that size. That, that slide is the uh, expeditions that were taking place in the 1930s, including Sven, Hayden, Sven Hayden's trip that gave popularity to this idea of a transcontinental route. If we go back to that slide, um, what you see during the Cold War is that the current, the idea of a trans-regional, transcontinental history really has very little currency. Um, there, there are geocultural, geocleavages of the Cold War, and so uh, Western academic scholars are not able to get into Soviet states to, to uh, build on the research of the 1920s and 30s that was beginning to gain momentum. And so it only really surfaces again uh, uh, at the end of the Cold War and, and the need to write a history, a pre-modern history of globalization that kind of offered some interpretation to what was going on in the 1990s. However, there was one country that did continue to invest some energy and um, had interest in the Silk Roads, and that was Japan. So what happened in Japan after the Second World War was um, uh, the country needed to rebuild its relations with its Southeast Asian neighbors and with China uh, after the, after the uh, devastating um, uh, events of, the, of, the, of that Second World War in the East Asian theater of the conflict. So the Silk Roads became this uh, platform to rebuild Sino-Japanese relations. So what you see there um, in those two central slides is Tanaka's visit to, to Mao in Peking in 72, just after Nixon visited, upon which the uh, proposal happened of a documentary that would trace the Silk Roads between East Asia um, or China and Japan um, that was made in the, by the uh, two state broadcasters, NHK and CCTV in the mid 1970s and broadcast around the world in the early 1980s. Uh, Japan or Tokyo hosted the, the first Olympics after in Asia after the Second World War and the, uh, the carrier of the flag, um, as you see there, who was, uh, who was born on the uh, day of the bombing of the, the atomic bombing, the dropping of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, carried the Silk Road, or a number of people obviously carried it along what was termed the Southern Silk Road through a number of countries from Athens as it made its way across to East Asia for the, in the run up, in the weeks running up to that Olympic event. So what we see is that the uh, Silk Road starts to uh, gain visibility as this trans-regional, trans-cultural uh, history, but it also enters um, an, an arena of international diplomacy. And this really takes off at the end of the Cold War when the UN uh, are concerned with rebuilding uh, international relations and obviously the uh, East-West and reducing suspicions between East and West. And so the Silk Road gains this currency to tell this story of peaceful, harmonious relations between regions, between countries and between civilizations. So, so UNESCO runs a, a decade long project from 1988 to the 1997, which involves a whole series of events, including conferences, scholarly publications, museum exhibitions um, and uh, and uh, journalistic reports in a, multi in a multitude of countries from South America uh, right across to Northern Europe. Now, what also took place were a number of expeditions and that's what this map here demonstrates. And these were, again, tracing this, these pre-modern connections and very much privileging, not the story of empires and conflict and piracy, but a story of peaceful, harmonious connections, the story of spice routes, the story of of uh, uh, trade of silk and, um, and merchants crossing oceans and frontiers, and also seafaring history. So it was very much a romanticized nostalgia of pre-modern Eurasian history. What we see there then, which is also quite interesting, is this dramatic expansion of the geographies of the Silk Road from, from uh, von Richthofen's original notion in the 1870s of a singular route that connects uh, northwest China around that area that's uh, Kashgar, Arumchi and Dunhuang across to southern Europe. But now we have it uh, spanning up into Japan, uh, down through the Red Sea and all the way down to Southeast Asia. 
There were reasons why that happened, which I won't go into, but I can uh, uh, recommend some publications later if anybody's interested in that. So, and what we also see then is the idea of the maritime Silk Road entering international policy or international cultural policy for the first time. So in that ship you see in the top left there is the Fulk al Salama, which was lent to the UN by the Sultan of Oman uh, during the first Gulf War of 1990 to 1991, with, that, um, with the country not wanting to be drawn into, uh, uh, into that conflict and wanting to be seen as part of the international community, promoting peace around the region. So he lent the ship to, uh, to the UN, where it left Venice, went through the Suez Canal, flying the flag of the United Nations, all the way across to the Korean Peninsula and into southern Japan, telling the story of uh, peaceful relations, peaceful maritime uh, connectivities that should be restored in a post-Cold War era. Uh, journalists and academics were on board, uh, lots, lots of lectures were given, and, and these journalists obviously wrote these up for, for the global media. Now, post 9-11, the Silk Road story returns to Central Asia and, uh, and Southern Asia on the back of 9-11, the events of 9-11. So what you see in the bottom left and right hand side there are, is the uh, uh, Washington Mall, the Smithsonian Institute runs a Silk Roads, Roads of Dialogue um, exhibition through the, their summer uh, exhibition uh, in the year immediately after 9-11, after so 2002. And this is what I would suggest potentially the most strategically important sort of public and diplomatically significant public space in the world. So this was telling the story of Central Asia and the uh, Muslim world as not necessarily just the source of uh, extreme fundamentalist Islam, but also as a, a region of peaceful uh, cultural connectivities that stretches back centuries. So it was, it was trying to present another narrative of that region. Um, uh, this also gets picked up in the United Nations again. So Khatami, uh, the Iranian leader, uh, post 9-11, also signals uh, this language of the dialogue of civilizations. And at that time, um, uh, Koichiro Matsura was a director general of UNESCO at that time. Um, and he was instrumental in, in leading that Roads of Dialogue uh, project during the 1980s that was led by UNESCO. So he supports this dialogue of civilizations. And the Silk Roads is a good example of, of, um, of, of one of the uh, ways in which that language should be uh, given a geographical and historical form. So whilst Huntington was talking about the clash of civilizations, there were organizations around the world that were trying to shift the language and, and the relationship between civilizational histories and international relations in a much more positive um, and uh, productive way. And obviously organizations like the UN were part of that. So what we see though, um, then, and one of the things I've been arguing the last few years is that from that uh, initial 1870s idea of Ferdinand von Richthofen, this notion of a silk route, um, in his quite narrow conception of this uh, idea of silk trade between Han Dynasty China and the Roman Empire, we've seen this dramatic expansion, both in time where the quintessential Silk Road traveler in, the, in Europe is Marco Polo, but Marco Polo doesn't travel to the 13th century. So we have this history, this one term that spans now 2000 or even 3000 years um, and uh, an entire continent and oceans. So one of the things I think what we've seen and what I've tried to indicate to you in the last few minutes is that it comes, it, it comes to be associated with certain ideals and values. The ideas of cross-cultural dialogue, peace and cooperation, peaceful relations and dialogue between civilizations. The idea that cosmopolitan is a good thing for humanity and is an, is a, is an a historical natural order. In the post-Cold War, it's about telling the story of peaceful East-West uh, relations and, and creating those forms of dialogue and also the ways in which uh, we can have interpolity relations. So the Silk Road becomes this uh, powerful way to, to narrate those types of histories um, in the modern era. And of course, what we've seen then is that in the age of Belt and Road, China and, and Xi Jinping is co-opting this for a very strategic and what is perhaps the most ambitious foreign policy agenda ever launched by a single country. So there you see um, uh, Xi Jinping visiting UNESCO uh, less than six months after the launch of Belt and Road, saying that uh, civilizations are the future of, uh, of peaceful international affairs and that China can lead the way in this. And the Silk Road is the demonstration 
of China's peaceful engagement with the region, with its own region and with uh, other regions historically, such as Europe and, and the African continent. Now, um, that map there is a, is a more familiar map in terms of what you might see again in, in, in uh, a number of academic and think tank publications of the economic and developmental corridors of Belt and Road uh, and the, the new Eurasia land bridge. And these are critical um, in terms of how China has, uh, in a 2015 report, strategized how to uh, direct its investments across these different regions. And that blue dotted line is the maritime Silk Road of the 21st century, as it's often documented. But what we've also seen is an increase, as I mentioned, in the cultural sector. And what we and that what these number of dots show you here are the uh, locations that are now being identified by the UNESCO organizations and its advisory bodies, such as uh, ICOMOS, um, which is based in Paris, of all the locations that could and should be designated as Silk Road World Heritage sites. Now, World Heritage you may think is just a, uh, a particular brand and a um, uh, and a, a, a brand for promoting tourism and and, um, and managing and, and profiteering from that. But for a number of countries, whether it's Iran, China, India, this has become the cultural Olympics. It demonstrates civilizational histories. It demonstrates pride that speaks back to those eras of of empire and colonialism. Same with a whole series of countries around the world. So it's, it has a really deep political investment in different regions. And so this idea of uh, rather than signaling this is a particular uh, in, historically important site for one country, the Silk Road says that these places are historically important because they, they show a whole series of his, historical, religious, cultural um, connectivities or scientific connectivities. So the, uh, the blue dots were listed in 2014 as a transnational or transboundary nomination where China joined up with Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and created a Buddhist corridor that runs up through Northwest China into, into those neighboring countries, which is one of the first uh, uh, transboundary Silk Road uh, nominations to, to actually be listed. And what we're seeing now is a whole series of countries grouping together in, in in regional configurations to, to bring those other dots, whether it's green or red ones, that um, into further Silk Road nominations. And we're going to see that over the coming years. What that doesn't tell you, obviously, is the maritime Silk Road. So there's a there's a whole nother policy agenda to, to produce reporting and, and a policy initiative that would match that overland for the next 20 to 30 years that balance out that maritime history to world history. But what this begins to show you then is how this this historical idea of the Silk Road overlays with the, with the developmental corridors of Belt and Road. This is important because China has about 150 million Chinese tourists going out every year uh, before COVID, and that will resume no doubt after COVID uh, borders and international borders resume over the next four to five years. Um, and this has huge economic power to it. And I'll come back to that later. But it's not only in terms of uh, on the ground development, but I'll give you some examples why I think this is much more than just soft power because of the, the, the ways in which this now folds in the digital economies of, of countries and, and the 5G technologies and uh, digital Silk Road platforms that China's rolling out through Belt and Road. But I'll come back to that shortly. So as well as that, um, uh, hard infrastructure on the ground of Silk Road histories that you can see within um, uh, archaeological and historic urban landscapes that get transformed into world heritage. We're also seeing a, a, an explosion of cultural activities around festivals, field festivals, food and film festivals, theatre alliances, telling the story of Silk Road connectivities. Now, this is very much an invented history, you could argue, given that the term only goes back 130 or so years. Um, but, but what we're seeing is a whole number of countries jumping on this um, to, to demonstrate and try and argue and to the populace, to their own populations and to an international community that they were friends 1300 years ago or a thousand years ago. They were friends on the Silk Road and that reviving the Silk Road for the 21st century is about reviving friendships and trust and trade and dialogue. This has powerful connotations in in a number of regions where it's being framed, all this cultural stuff is being framed as a dialogue of Asian civilizations. So in the West, the Silk Road history is often seen as a uh, East-West connectivity. 
but in Asia, it's seen as an intra-regional Asia. The histories of connections between uh, uh, the Arab world, the, the Buddhist world, and so on and so forth. This is really powerful language today, where reviving the Silk Roads is about reviving these non-Western uh, pride, these non-Western geographies, these non-Western trade relations that, that have, um, that is proclaimed to be, that were suppressed through uh, centuries or eras of European colonialism and, and a world system that put Europe at the center of international trade and, and geopolitics. So this idea of reviving historical connections is far more powerful than I think most uh, people in the West have taken credit or given credit to in the last few years. So what we see here is an example of a museum, not in China, but in Singapore. Um, so this is a number of countries that are responding to this language of a maritime silk road. I emphasize this terminology only really goes back 30 years. But this is, uh, this is being picked up by a number of countries signaling to their own populations that Singapore's place in the world needs to return to the sea. This is strategically important. This is critical for a country like Singapore with the Belt and Road uh, infrastructure programs potentially cutting it out of the transcontinental shipping routes that it's been so uh, powerfully uh, engineering in the last few decades. So here's an example of, of a public diplomacy project within the Singaporean uh, geographies of, uh, of, it, of the city state. Now, what we're also seeing is investments uh, in uh, China's uptake around a maritime archeology. span On one level, that seems quite trivial. But the, if you take those two gray circles there, what we're seeing is a convergence between where the Belt and Road infrastructure uh, projects are happening and the cultural sector projects around, uh, around the Silk Road histories. And in this case, it's Kenya and Sri Lanka and the, the maritime archaeology projects that China is now leading in those two regions that converge with its bigger uh, Belt and Road partners. So what we see uh, in countries like Sri Lanka is this idea of rewriting uh, regional histories where it's beneficial for China to say that it was a center of a civilizational zone, that uh, China is a maritime hist historical power on, and a peaceful one um, on par with any European maritime power historically. But also for countries like Sri Lanka, this helps them place themselves within an Indian Ocean uh, past and future that has massive strategic benefits. The, the language of reviving the Silk Roads of the 21st century is all about reviving peaceful connectivities. So for, for Sri Lanka, for a small country like Sri Lanka, this helps them re, uh, uh, rekindle ideas of a peaceful Indian Ocean zone, which was their contribution to the non-aligned non movement during the Cold War, as you see in, these, in this slide here. So picking up the themes that China is pushing through the Belt and Road Initiative and this idea of reviving peaceful interpolity relations, uh, intercultural relations historically. Uh, this is very productive for a small country like Sri Lanka as it maneuvers between uh, the European Union, China, India, and the US in the 21st century. So what we're therefore witnessing is huge investments in, uh, in maritime underwater archeology span and port histories in China. So those are the uh, uh, examples of institutions that have ha opened in the, in the country over the last few years. This is a dramatic shift for China in embracing its maritime past in a way that uh, it distanced itself from, obviously, given these uh, associations that the sea has in, in, in terms of the century of humiliation and the, and the treaty port system that was set up through the British um, during the mid 19th century. So this is China revisiting the oceans and the seas around it. Um, in terms of its own uh, projections of the past into the future. So this is coupled with significant investments and for deep water, underwater and ocean bed searching. About a month ago, I think I'm right in saying, uh, China has now uh, had a crude submersible that's reached the bottom of the, the deepest part of the ocean's floor um, and, and setting the world record for this. And so what we're also seeing in terms of uh, space exploration, China's uh, Ex investing heavily in ocean bed exploration, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And part of that is a search for shipwrecks across the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. And I would refer you to the work of Jeff Adams, who's been writing some really interesting stuff over the last six or seven years and the importance, strategic importance of uh, uh, shipwreck archaeology in, uh, in China's historical claims towards the South China Sea. So whilst there's a lot of attention and media attention around 
uh, islands and infrastructure bases. There's other stuff going on as well that doesn't receive the, uh, the press that it uh, deserves. So what that uh, slide there shows you is the Nanhai One Museum in southern China that is a wreck that was found in the South, in the South China Sea that now has its own dedicated museum. So you might think these are just individual museums. But China's been undertaking an extraordinary explosion of museums around its country. Uh, 4,000 opened, 4,100 opened over a six to seven year period. It now has more than 5,000 museums up from the, just 375 in the uh, 1970s. So this is a dramatic uptake in its revaluing, its revisiting of its history. Now, as I'm sure many of you would uh, be familiar with, often it's um, a country such as China doesn't do these things for on a whim. There are particular and strategic reasons why it might be investing this scale of funds into that um, cultural policy. Now, what this slide begins to give you an example of is the ways in which this idea of a maritime past is being connected to the future. So those meta tags or those keywords you see at the bottom, eco cities, Belt and Road initiatives, Zheng He, coastal China, temples, smart cities, the maritime Silk Road. Um, this is very much about saying this is a maritime past, this is a maritime future for the country. Now, why is that significant? Well, I'll give you a sense of that in a second. But it's accompanied with this big investment in public sculptures. Again, perhaps potentially very trivial. These, are, these have uh, emerged in the, over the last 10 to 15 years, whether it's uh, um, admirals such as Zheng He or sea goddesses that tell the story of the uh, spread of religion and China's outward uh, connections to the Arab world, to the Persian world, and so on and so forth that are being rekindled for the 21st century. We are, seeing, we are seeing children's cartoons. Uh, this, this one on the Maritime Silk Road won the best TV uh, program just a month ago in China. Why is, it a, what, why is a children's television program significant? Well, I'll bring you to the example of Britain. Um, I grew up in the UK and, uh, and Trafalgar Square that you see on the, in that slide was central to my sort of schooling education. And I didn't understand that as a child of why that's significant. But reading this book a number of decades later, which I guess some of you are familiar with, if not all of you, um, it tells a story of sea power states. And the book very much differentiates between sea power and the idea of a sea and a sea state. Um, and I quote from uh, page six. And what, do you, what, what basically Andrew Lambert identifies is that there have been five um, powers in, in history that have defined themselves through a, through a sea culture and, and, um, and a maritime culture. And that's Athens. Carthage, Venice, the Dutch Republic, and Britain. And I quote from page six, where he states that in the contemporary world today, and that's today, Russia, China, and the United States all possess sea power, a strategic option that can be exercised by any state with a coast, money, and manpower. But these continental military, sea, military superpowers are not sea powers. The sea is at best a marginal factor in their identities. And so the whole book really traces out what that difference between a continental power and a sea power is. So I think when I give those examples of public art, children's uh, uh, television around maritime histories, that explosion of museums, a number of which are then now dedicated to the, to the uh, uh, maritime histories, what we might be seeing in China in the 21st century is a cultivation of a sea culture and the transformation of China, not just into a continental power, but also into a sea power in the way that Andrew Lambert's described in his book. Now, it's where the Silk Road and this idea of a maritime Silk Road and overland Silk Road is gaining currency and why it's uh, particularly powerful, I think, in 21st century international affairs, is that it's being picked up by a whole series of intergovernmental organizations and intergovernmental bodies. So you see a few examples of that here. And this, and this brings me back to that idea of the, uh, the, the ways in which the ideas and values and associations that the Silk Road has had attached to it and become associated with the term in the, tw in the 20th century around into peaceful relations, harmonious trade, harmonious intercultural dialogue, so on and so forth. So these countries now are very much pushing this um, on the back of the Belt and Road Initiative. So UNESCO is spending heavily, investing heavily and bringing in multilateral programs for this Silk Roads program, and I encourage you to go to their site um, to illustrate, to, to give you a sense of the, of the themes that they're pushing now. They have 18 themes. So this is now being uh, seen by UNESCO in Paris as uh, phase two from the end of that Cold War 
uh, multilateral program uh, of the Silk Roads. Uh, they've now, in, in the age of Belt and Road, opening up their phase two and building these uh, uh, multi-sector, whether it's science, education, culture, or in this case, from this slide you see here, um, uh, exchanges and histories of medicine and uh, chemistry, which has been accelerated because of COVID. So UNESCO, as with other UN agencies, very much uh, uh, foregrounding international cooperation and international dialogue. And our anxiety is about the closing of international borders with, with um, uh, COVID. And I spoke to the director of this program yesterday, who, in, who indicated that the Silk Roads for them is, is now a project to indicate the transnational, trans-regional, transcontinental exchange, trade, uh, is always the natural state of affairs. It's a historical state of affairs that's been undermined by COVID, and it's a state of affairs that we should be re returning to um, in a post-COVID world. So uh, what would also uh, this program does, which is being pushed by UNESCO, but also UN Habitat, UNHCR, and other organizations within the UN system, is the idea of the Silk Roads can produce forms of dialogue between uh, the youth of the world. So this is an example of the youth eyes um, that uh, uh, is now being framed uh, as a Silk Roads project, which is about generating international dialogue between younger generations across borders. And so the Silk Road then also plugs into the UN's uh, SDGs, the uh, 17 goals that it's identified um, uh, for the next uh, decade or so, that are about poverty reduction, intercultural dialogue, addressing climate change, and so all of these agendas are being plugged into this into this Silk Road program across the UN system, primarily through UNESCO, but by, but by other agencies as well. Um, uh, and it brings us back to those Belt and Road developmental corridors and re reducing poverty through tourism and so on and so forth. So what I'm giving you a sense here then is that um, uh, you might read in a number of US uh, Washington based think tank publications that China has hardly any soft power. But the presentation I'm suggesting to, to this morning is that through the Silk Road initiatives, China's got a lot more soft power than we may think. And it's using the UN and international agencies to do that. What I also wanna do just in the final few minutes is to say that this is more than just soft power than we're seeing here today. Um, I'll give you an example of, of tourism and why I think that has uh, significant uh, political implications that are more than just uh, Nye's notion of soft power in the 21st century. So this report here was published uh, last year by the UNWTO, the World Tourism Organization, that identified the idea of a maritime silk road for the 21st century around uh, connectivities for infrastructure investment around tourism. East Asia, particularly China and Japan, have the world's fastest growing uh, ship cruise ship market. And that's obviously been suspended because of COVID. But um, surprisingly, the cruise ship market's rebounding uh, quicker than you would expect through um, uh, as borders and, and um, mobilities reopen um, in, the, in a post-COVID transition world, particularly in East Asia. And so these are locations which are the cruise ship ports um, and uh, identified that should be the locations for this maritime Silk Road cruise ship industry. Now, this is very much extending this idea of a maritime sea history outwards from China to show that China, again, its, its influence stretches across the Mediterranean, uh, stretches across the Indian Ocean, all the way across to the Mediterranean, up the Red Sea, up through the Suez Canal. And this is telling the story of a China's historical connectivities in a peaceful, benign way, but also the spread of Chinese civilization and the, and the positive impact it's had uh, historically, and therefore uh, encouraging the 1.4 billion people to get behind the Belt and Road Initiative and see the legitimacy of the state's agenda for this extremely ambitious and therefore risky uh, foreign policy uh, program of Belt and Road. Now, where that's more than just soft power is that this, uh, the huge infrastructure programs that are coming around this, a number of countries wholly depend, or cities particularly, but a number of countries heavily, if not wholly depend on, on international tourism. So this slide here is from Malacca which is uh, one of the key uh, infrastructure nodes of the Belt and Road project in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia. Um, and as you see from that top left, that's an urban development project that's part of the $9 billion gateway uh, Malacca program that's uh, part of a deep water port just up from Singapore, but also is about um, uh, the connections of the Maritime Silk Road historically 
where Zheng He's voyages in the 15th century, the Chinese admiral sailed across from south, southern China, stopped off in Malacca as he as he uh, voyaged onwards to in, to across the Indian Ocean down into East Africa. So this and there's a number of overseas Chinese in in Malaysia and Malacca in particular who want to celebrate these uh, histories and 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 uh, profit. Uh, economically from the tourism that this, these types of histories will generate. If we turn to the Black Sea region, uh, this is the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization that is pu pushing Silk Road tourism to, to lure that part of that uh, outbound Chinese uh, market to the West Asia region and the, and the Southern Europe region. And this is being supported by, again by the UNWTO, the World Tourism Organization, which is coming up with the idea of a Western Silk Road. Um, which draws this uh, geography of connectivity and this idea of, of romanticized pre-modern connectivities in trade that is not about conflict, that's not about the conflicts of the modern era in the Balkans region, um, that's, that's tore this uh, Black Sea region apart in the last uh, 30 or so years, but is, is celebrating histories of peaceful intercultural interreligious dialogue to, to, to promote tourism and, and uh, relations within the region, but also uh, to capture that East Asian market. That has big in infrastructure implications for, for cruise ship industries and the port investments in the Black Sea region and, the, and in the Mediterranean um, as that will unfold over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. But what we're also seeing then is, is the ways in which um, uh, for the US market, uh, for, for tourists visiting internationally or for European tourists, um, that will be Google, uh, there will be WeChat, uh, sorry, uh, be WhatsApp, it will be a whole suite of uh, mobile app programs that will be underpinning, supporting an international tourism market, um, the Airbnb phenomena, so on and so forth, that we've all become familiar with in the last few years. But in the Chinese world of international tourism, there's a whole app ecology and a mobile app world economy that, um, that these countries such as Turkey, such as Bulgaria, are now being encouraged to be drawn into. Um, so what you see that slide is a, is a number of Chinese think tanks that are offering advice to these countries in Southern Europe to say, um, if you want to be visible on this hugely profitable um, Chinese outbound tourism industries, you need to be on this uh, app economy, um, on the WeChat programs, promoting uh, your country, your locations, your industries um, to this outbound Chinese market. So here's some examples. Um, it's not just about tourism promotion, it's a bit about international uh, platform uh, payment platforms. Um, and that's been obviously a kind of a significant geopolitical dimension of the 20th century in terms of the, of the influence that Visa and MasterCard have had and the, and the uh, um, affordances they've had for the uh, Western uh, financial systems. And China's now trying to counter that with its own international payment system, such as Alipay and WeChat so on and so forth, that are enticing these countries to draw it into that, into that sphere. And as you can see there, um, the, the huge scale of uh, um, usage of these, uh, of these uh, apps of, of the, uh, for the outbound Chinese tourist um, and, and giving credibility to those claims that if you're not on these systems, um, you are invisible. Now, what, that's more than just payment structures. That's more about international finance. Um, it's also... Um, bringing new, way, new ways to think about big data systems, uh, the link uh, heritage, tourism, development, cultural dialogue into this new world of AI, uh, big data gathering. So here's a number of, uh, well, here's just one example of that. Um, this being linked to smart cities, international marketing of these cities, and, uh, and the whole ecosystems that we're seeing being uh, built around this kind of international uh, travel industry. Here's one uh, final example that I give you from uh, the Armenian uh, um, tourism industry. Uh, that's about this supposedly a project that's about measuring customer satisfaction around Silk Road tourism in, um, uh, in Armenia, which is in sort of the West Asia, Central Asia region. Um, but you might be interested to know that this Travel Insights program is being sponsored by the UNDP and the Russian government. So clearly there's some interesting developments happening here um, and this use of big data through these industries, through these connectivities, through these people-to-people uh, um, -people exchanges that are part of the Belt and Road Initiative um, that is not reaching the international media and the critique that I think it deserves. So finally, I'm going to give you the uh, counter to a lot of this China initiative, which is 
one example among a number which is, comes from India, which is the, um, the response of India in the last few years has been to say that, well, if, if China is pushing this maritime Silk Road and the idea of an overland Silk Road as a, as a strategic architecture um, to build alliances in the 21st century, we need to respond. And their uh, project to do that is Project Morsam. Morsam is the Arabic word for monsoon winds. So what this is a project to build a geostrategic block of around 20 to 25 countries around the Indian Ocean that puts Indian, the India at the center of uh, a strategic geography using histories um, as to say that we have always been connected to this region. And again, this is a domestic project and an international diplomacy project to say that um, we have always been tied historically, culturally, religious connections, and we should be reviving those of the 21st century, um, uh, whether it's down to Southeast Asia or across to um, uh, East Africa. So uh, that's um, uh, been gaining momentum again in the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, and, and I encourage you to sort of look at that because that's very much about uh, India reconfiguring its strategic interests away from uh, land-based invasions, which was what it suffered over a number of centuries, obviously, towards, um, it, towards its maritime domain, which is largely ignored in, in the uh, recent decades strategically. So that's it. Um, there's the publication that uh, I've mentioned a couple of times, Geocultural Power, um, that hopefully uh, maps out a whole series of those themes and threads and, um, and there's a website that I've got up online that's called silkroadfutures.net, which gives you a sense of the, some of those uh, themes I've talked about this morning, um, but also pre presents a number of those videos and opens up to other themes um, and, and gives you some indication of other uh, publications that are on there that um, speak to the kind of uh, topics that I've been talking about. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tim.